Welcome to episode 444 of the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I'm Ashley Scott Myers, screenwriter and blogger of SellingYourScreenplay.com. Today, I am interviewing producer and director Rick Dugdale. He's been producing for years, including films like An Ordinary Man, starring Ben Kingsley. But he's turned his talents to directing, and he recently directed a feature film called Zero Context, starring Anthony Hopkins. Both as a producer and director, he's got a lot of great advice for screenwriters. And we talked through this recent film, Zero Contact, and how he was able to get that film produced. Produced. So stay tuned for that interview. If you find this episode valuable, please help me out by giving me a review in iTunes or leaving a comment on YouTube or retweeting the podcast on Twitter or liking or sharing it on Facebook. These social media shares really do help spread word about the podcast, so they're very much appreciated. Any websites or links that I mention in the podcast can be found on my blog in the show notes. I also publish a transcript with every episode in case you'd rather read the show or look at something later on. You can find all the podcast show notes at www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash podcast, and then just look for episodes number 444. If you want my free guide, How to Sell a Screenplay in Five Weeks, you can pick that up by going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. It's completely free. You just put in your email address and I'll send you a new lesson once per week for five weeks along with a bunch of bonus lessons. I teach the whole process of how to sell your screenplay in that guide. I'll teach you how to write a professional logline and query letter and how to find agents, managers, and producers who are looking for material. Really is everything you need to know to sell your screenplay. Just go to selling your screenplay.com slash guide. So now let's get into the main segment. Today I'm interviewing producer and director Rick Dugdale. Here is the interview. Welcome Rick to the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I really appreciate you coming on the show with me today. Great. Thanks for having me. So to start out, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your background. Where did you grow up and how did you get interested in the entertainment business? I uh, grew up in small town Canada, moved to Vancouver uh, very young, right out of high school, basically, and got my start on X-Files uh, okay. in the mid-90s, climbed the ranks in physical production, and uh, realized maybe early on that uh, producing would be my path, and then moved to Los Angeles about 20 years ago, partnered up with Dan Preacher Jr. officially in 2003, and uh, we've been producing movies since 2006, 2007. Okay. And so let's talk about that relationship a little bit um, with Dan Petrie Jr. Um, how did you meet him and how did you impress him enough to, you know, become his partner? At this point, he was pr pretty well established in the business. Um, so, you know, how did you kind of get on his radar, get that job and, and, and become, you know, good enough acquaintances that you guys would work on multiple projects? Yeah. So he was the, one of the producers and writers of a film called The Sixth Day with Arnold Schwarzenegger. And that was shooting in Vancouver in 99. And I was one of the location managers. And so we just kind of hit it off. And, and he said, hey, you know, you got to make it to LA at some point. And maybe we team up. And I thought, you know, he wasn't being completely serious. But uh, I would go back and forth to LA maybe once a month and kind of learn the aspects of development and script acquisition and optioning and stuff that I didn't really know much about at that point. You don't do a lot of that in Canada. Mm -hmm. And so in 2003, he called me up. I was finishing up. I think Catwoman at the time. And, and he said, Hey, can you be in New Mexico tomorrow? Uh, I got this film that I'm directing and uh, I'm going to be scouting. I said, yeah, actually I can, I can be in New Mexico. Huh. So I hopped on a plane, flew to New Mexico. And then uh, that film actually didn't end up going, but he said, you're here now. Why don't we work together? And so that was the day I pretty much moved to LA. Yeah. Did you always in the back of your mind have this idea that you eventually wanted to direct something? Um, you, you like, what was that sort of initial passion that got you into the business? I grew up as a child actor, okay. actually. And, you know, very young, I realized that where my talents slide and it probably wasn't in front of the camera. And uh, so then, you know, early on in high school and in film school, I was directing stuff, but that's, you know, more students, short films and whatnot. So I always knew there was an interest there at some point, but also going through years of being a producer, there's the odd script that you would read or the, the kind of business concept that it would stick out to me in a different way, more of a creative sense of, you know, a real vision for something it doesn't happen to me that often. And I read a lot of scripts, but uh, I knew the day would come where I'd direct, uh, you know, once you had more mm -hmm. confidence and experience behind it. 
Gotcha. I'm curious. Um, you just sort of made a comment, um, you know, that you felt that you were not going to succeed being in front of the camera as an actor. Um, talk about that, if you can, a little bit. What are those realizations like? I mean, how do you ever really know, um, you know, for sure? Like, how do you ever really know that you're not going to make it as a writer or a director or as an actor or any of these fields? Like, what was it that sort of gave you the clues to say, well, maybe producing is, is where I'm going to find my path? Um, how do you have that realization? Because it's very difficult for for a lot of us to sort of accept the fact that maybe this isn't the path for us well i think it's better said that it, it's just another path you can still have that path available to you is kind of how i looked at it mm -hmm. i know the process i was trained enough i had already done you know hundreds of auditions and i've done some you know enough of the work to say i could come back to that but i think you know i always knew it was maybe more leadership driven and i knew that that was maybe something more for for me, um, you know, I used to be the guy who jokingly would take the short film and want to make a feature. You know, there's always a passion to drive the train forward. And uh, it just seemed like a natural fit to me. And in Canada, when you work in the, as a PA, you're in the, in the Directors Guild of Canada. That's the union. In the U.S., you're like Teamsters, I believe. And so, but you hit a fork in the road after 30 days or 180 days later on. And that is, do you want to be an AD or do you want to be a location department, right? 99% would go the AD path because that was their ticket they thought to directing and or let's call that the glamour path. But the, I feel the smart ones would realize that the ticket to producing and longer job security. And so I was 21, 22 years old and I'd have five or $6 million in my department to manage as a location manager. Now in today's world, you can make three movies for that price, <laughs> right? And, and the reality is you were you were on four months before production started because you're scouting. Then, then they agree to shoot in Vancouver or wherever. Then they hire the production manager and the line producer, right? Then you shoot for six or seven months. Again, back when you had long schedules. And then you'd, you know, so you'd, you'd be on it longer. So the smarter move was go that path. But um, that's where I realized like, wait a second, this is that much closer to producing and you're being hired by the studio in LA. So, um, you know, I knew that that would be the path I would take at that yeah. point. Yeah, yeah, gotcha. I, I understand. Um, so let's talk, let's dig into your latest feature film, Zero Contact, starring Anthony Hopkins. Maybe to start out, you can give us a quick pitch or a log line. What is this film all about? Yeah, this is a film about five people coming together on Zoom to solve uh, basically a riddle as to how to shut down this time machine that Finley Hart, Anthony Hopkins' character, has developed uh, in the past. And whether it's good for mankind or not, that's what we're about to find out. Huh. And how did you get involved with this um, screenplay? Um, how did the screenplay come across your table? And, and how, as I said, how did you get on as a director? So this is a film, you know, we're week one into the pandemic and, you know, we shoot movies all over the world. And we brought an international think tank together of our friends and colleagues from around the world. And we said, all right, well, for all filmmakers, how do we make a film if we can't be in the same room together? And so we started, you know, kind of coming up with some ideas and, and so then we got off the phone and uh, Zoom, I guess. Cam Cannon, who works with us, we're a very writer-centric company. Dan Petrie Jr. is my business partner. We have Todd Ireland, Cam Cannon. These are produced screenwriters who work for us in-house and with us as, as team members. So Cam and I came up with this idea, uh, you know, what if five world leaders were assassinated at the same time around the world? Uh, that was kind of the genesis of where this would go. Mm -hmm. which is not this film, of course, but Cam is an incredible writer and ran with this idea. And 10 days later, we had a script, 10 days. And we looked at the script and said, wait a second, this not only is a good story, this is logistically possible. And so from there, um, you know, Cam and I also produced it. And, you know, I reached out to our colleagues all around the world, really with the pitch as to how we're going to shoot this movie remotely. And, you know, we had to convince them it wouldn't be a waste of their time. So then you get Japan, you get Germany and you get Serbia and France and Stockholm. You get all these countries kind of, OK, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. And then it was more of a I would run it from the war room in Los Angeles. You have monitors all over the place, which is what I was envisioning, because you would do a company move from Japan to Germany in the middle of the night. Biggest company move ever. But <laughs> it was my producer colleague, Peter Tomasas, who said, all right, so who's Who's going to direct it? I said, well, I think I'm going to direct it. And, and it was based on like running the war room 
not fully thinking of like, we really need an official director because this is a weird experimental film. But then you realize, well, someone's got to talk to the actors. Someone's got to have the story in their head. Someone's mm-hmm. got to drive this thing forward. And uh, so then I, I, and also knowing the concept and where we want to go with it for the sequels, it just made sense that I would direct it. And so my day came. And I guess today's the day I direct a movie. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about the development of this script. Um, it sounds like you were in place early on with developing the idea. What did that look like working with the writer? Um, how did you guys actually work? Were you guys ever in the same room? Was all of that remote? Um, you give him notes, he would write a, a scene and then do you wait for a full draft? Maybe just talk through that development process a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Yeah, well, the very first thing we realized is that we were not in the same room because we, we wanted to stay true to this idea as well. So everyone was completely remote all around the world. Mm-hmm. And, and it was in the very beginning of the pandemic when, you know, I guess we we're really supposed to abide by the rules at that point. But if you're going to shoot a film during the pandemic, we knew that we weren't the only ones thinking this. But if you had to gamble, 90 percent of the people are going to say, all right, let's do a horror movie uh, or slasher movie. And. And that was kind of the concept that we wanted to avoid at that point. And so we said, it's got to be international with multiple dialects and different languages, and it can't be about the pandemic. And so that was kind of as, as Cam was writing it and he, you know, Cam was sending a draft and I had to, Hey, the character of, of, uh, you know, Randy, let's make that Riku and let's make him Japan or J- Japanese because TJ, my colleague in Japan is a great actor and I bet you he could play the part, mm-hmm. right? Okay, great. And then I would, we were kind of working off countries that we know and work in with colleagues in these countries that would maybe, you know, come on board. And then we were adapting the script all through that process as people were coming on to the project because, you know, shooting like this, you know, we say it's, it's like a podcast and that is you need to find production value in really in every music cue in a podcast here, similar th- thing we, we only have so many resources but if you don't make it you know the production value and scope and scale something interesting then it's not going to be a film for the masses to see because we're tired of watching a film over zoom mm-hmm. and that's one thing through the script process is that we wanted to make it feel anything but a film that ever used zoom as a device so when you cut outside to the drone shots and that opens the film up when we have a lot of aerial shots of of all these different countries that opens the, the film up so at every turn in the script development process, we were looking for ways to increase production value with limited resources. Now that as a, as a, you know, as a writer myself, that sounds like very, um, you're giving him very practical suggestions. It's not like, well, I don't buy this story arc or this kind of things. Talk about that a little bit as a producer, and maybe you can even talk about some of these other projects you've worked on. Um, how do you see your role as a producer in helping develop these writers and these projects? Um, what is your role and, and what, what do you ultimately want to get out of this? Um, you know, as the producer leading the, the writer down a certain path, suppose they're not going a direction. Maybe you think they should. How do you sort of finesse that situation? Well, I think with this film, I mean, we also knew not that early on, but we wanted to make something that would allow for it to go elsewhere, like allow for other possibilities. I mean, our plan was to get this thing completed and out uh, in the, during the pandemic so that we could maybe, maybe there's a sequel or, or, you know, part two and part three. Now it's changed when the film got completed, which took us a lot longer because in post-production, all the VFX guys said, wait a second, we, we need more time because this actually worked. And then we obviously just finished the film you know, six months ago. Um, but in terms of, of script development, usually, I mean, I'm heavily involved in whether it be book adaptations or, or um, you know, the stuff that we're developing. A lot of it is driven by what we know the market to be. So whether you're adjusting a character, you know, I always say when you're a lot of writers will write something, but don't put as much thought into the actual characters and the character arcs. They put the focus on the storyline. If you focus on the characters and the dialogue that you're writing for those characters, you stand a better chance of casting the right actors that you're going to need to play those parts to get you distribution, thus get you mm-hmm. financing. So personally, that's the stuff that I focus on. We have a whole development team that's actually led by Cam Cannon. But I think you know, just my insights as the producer is that you got to make sure that you write, you know, stuff that you're going to get the actors that you need. And I think a lot of times you're seeing that 
overlooked quite a bit. Yeah. And you mentioned, you made another comment um, just a minute ago that when you were coming up with this script, you realized as a producer that it was very doable. Um, I mean, I think that's great advice what you just give to writers to really try and write great characters that actors want to play. But what was it also about this script that you felt made it doable? And are there any, I'm really just looking for some, maybe some counterintuitive things from a production standpoint that are, you get a lot of bang for your dollar. They're easy to do. They look great, but they don't cost a lot. And then maybe the opposite direction i mean we all know stadiums and crowds those are going to be expensive so i'm something low budget you got to avoid that but there are some other production things that maybe you could give us as tips as writers well one of the things i'd say is what people over the word they overuse is contained thriller it's those two words mm -hmm. but when people pitch me a contained thriller you've got to think so now we're getting off track a bit here but what i'm saying is that when you pitch a contained thriller as a writer think of what the marketing materials are going to look like if that key art and that trailer looks like every other teens in an RV, teens in the cabin, teens in the woods, horror movie, Friday the 13th. Don't write it because a marketing team and a distributor is going to have the same issues. Like, how do we make this look like something different? So that is something I talk a lot about is that the contained thriller. So think of like ex machina and high concept stuff that still can be done for the right price with two or three actors. But just think more high concept than contained thriller is something that I would I always say for writer's advice. In terms of this, is that the thing that we had to do with Zero Contact is that you had to make sure that the actors, you couldn't overwhelm them because we knew they were going to be by themselves. So their characters, we also need them to kind of produce it and, and run the camera. If you make their character arc so complex, or if you, obviously it's done over a short period of time in our storyline, but we couldn't overthink what they were going to have have to provide for us because they're playing multiple roles. And so, you know, you wanted to make sure like, whether it be like Chris Brochu's performance when he's having flashbacks and he can, there, he's just needs to be on camera and we could put a lot of that stuff in post-production. You couldn't rely on them. You didn't want, I shouldn't say couldn't rely on, we didn't want them to have to think through too much of it. Otherwise mm -hmm. it wasn't going to work. So, um, you know, work with, again, the resources that you had and don't overcomplicate things is the mm -hmm. key. Yeah. Yeah. Sound advice. I'm curious, just in general, how do scripts generally come across your desk? Um, as I said, you've got, you know, dozens of producing credits. Um, how do you typically find scripts? Does stuff come through agents? Does stuff come through, you know, friend of friends, personal referrals? Maybe talk about that screenwriters that are out there that want to get scripts into your office, into offices like yours. How, what, what is your approach and what do you advise on that? Yeah. Well, first off, yes, we see a lot from agents and managers, but at the same time, Again, we're a very writer-centric company and I know people need their break and they need their shot. If you're trying to break in and you're trying to get your sci-fi epic that clearly is $100 million plus you're trying to get to Steven Spielberg's hands, chances of you launching your career with that script is going to be pretty tough. Mm -hmm. But the key is, is if you're trying to break in, these writers, you, you write the high concept international thriller. I always talk about don't write the Idaho dairy farming script or as Dan will say, write what you know. And I say, write what you know, people will pay for. And right now people are paying for stuff that is international. It's got to work in 14, 15 territories for a global streamer to think it's going to work for them. Right. So, so I always say like, you can open a movie up. It should be the Idaho dairy farming, you know, young couple out of high school. And instead of running the farm, they go to, they go to uh, Italy, but they get caught up in an Albanian drug cartel. And now you're crossing borders, but mm -hmm. they escape and make it back to Idaho. Right. So you've opened your film up. You give your more your film, your script, more roads to the victory to get made. The other thing I'll say is the Austin Screenwriting Conference is the biggest and best in the world. We have been there. We're a sponsor there now for 10 years. Uh, we've been there 17 years officially. Um, that is ground zero to for all screenwriters. You should submit your scripts there. Anybody that goes there, we read the scripts that come from there and we sponsor the Andrew Entertainment category. And so there's a division for, uh, for our company and we've hired writers from there numerous times that are uh, in houses as well now too, and have gone on to other things. So that is ground zero for any screenwriter out there. We highly recommend that. Any of your listeners that do come there, please come say hello to Dan and myself. We'll okay. be there every year. So. Perfect. Perfect. So that's, that's fantastic. That's great advice. And I hope people do follow up with that. So how can people see zero contact? Do you know what the release schedule is going to be like and where it's going to be available? 
is coming out this Friday, May 27th. Uh, I know it's uh, limited theatrical around the country, VOD, Apple, I, uh, Apple TV, Amazon, I believe, are the two key places to find it. But uh, we'll be out there counter-programming to Top Gun. So please <laughs> check it out. <laughs> perfect, perfect. And what's the best way for people to keep up with what you're doing if they want to follow your career? Twitter, Facebook, a blog, anything you're comfortable sharing, I'll round up yeah. the show notes. Yeah, you can find me at Rick Dugdale on Instagram, Twitter, okay. uh, and on Facebook. There's a fan page on Facebook. Enderby Entertainment is on Facebook. If you have any questions, please ask us there. Okay. You know, we try to open it up to uh, to filmmakers as much as possible. It's perfect, perfect. Well, Rick, I really appreciate you coming on and talking with me. Um, good luck My with pleasure. this project and all your future projects. It sounded like this one, too. You have some con some concepts for a, a sequel and a additional sequel. Um, so we'll be seeing more of these movies in the future. We are in production on part two and three, which are uh, uh, conventional and yet unconventional. We're shooting all over the world in crazy locations. So you'll be hearing about that too. Okay, perfect, perfect. Yep, we look forward to hearing about that in the future as well. Well, again, thank you for coming on. Um, great talk and good luck with this film. Sounds good. Thanks so much. Thank you. We'll talk to you later. Bye. Bye. A quick plug for the SYS Screenwriting Analysis Service. It's a really economical way to get a high quality professional evaluation on your screenplay. When you buy our three pack, you get evaluations at just $67 per script for feature films and just $55 for teleplays. All the readers have professional experience reading for studios, production companies, contests, and agencies. You can read a short bio on each reader on our website, and you can pick the reader who you think is the best fit for your script. Turnaround time is usually just a few days, but rarely more than a week. The readers will evaluate your script on six key factors, concept, character, structure, marketability, tone, and overall craft, which includes formatting, spelling, and grammar. Every script will get a grade of pass, consider, or recommend, which should help you roughly understand where your script might rank if you were to submit it to a production company or agency. We can provide an analysis on features or television scripts. We also do proofreading without any analysis. We will also look at a treatment or outline and give you the same analysis on it. So if you're looking to vet some of your project ideas, this is a great way to do it. We will also write your logline and synopsis for you. You can add this logline and synopsis writing service to an analysis, or you can simply purchase this service as a standalone product. As a bonus, if your screenplay gets a recommend or a consider from one of our readers, you get to list the screenplay in the SYS Select database, which is a database for producers to find screenplays and a big part of our SYS Select program. Producers are in the database searching for material on a daily basis, so it's another great way to get your material in front of them. As a further bonus, if your script gets a recommend from one of our readers, your screenplay will get included in our monthly best of newsletter. Each month we send out a newsletter that highlights the best screenplays that have come through our script analysis service. This is monthly newsletter that goes out to our list of over 400 producers who are actively looking for material. So again, this is another great way to get your material out there. So if you want a professional evaluation of your screenplay at a very reasonable price, check out www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash consultants. Again, that's sellingyourscreenplay.com slash consultants. On the next episode of the podcast, I'm going to be interviewing writer-director Christine Chen about her new mermaid film called Urzuli. It's a fascinating talk about how she and her team were able to reach out to the mermaid community. Yeah, I didn't know there was any such thing as a mermaid community before talking with her, but really they, they got this mermaid community sort of behind their film, and that's been a big, big plus for them in terms of marketing it and just getting the word out there. It's a great template for someone looking to create niche content. She's very smart and very transparent about how she was able to get this film produced. So keep an eye out for this episode next week. That's our show. Thank you for listening.